Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Are non-competes now federally illegal? A recent law has been issued by the federal government that makes it impossible for employers to limit their former employees from competing with them. John Sauer, expert attorney at Goodspeed and Merrill, gives it about a 10% chance of not being overturned in court. Still, employers need to know what is happening now before the court cases go through. And in today's world, who knows what's really going to happen? As a quick reminder, the Expert Network team provides free consultations. We'd love the opportunity to be of service to you or someone you care about. Just scroll the liner notes to contact one of our experts or today's guest. And please share this podcast with anyone you think might find it interesting. As always, it's good to have an expert on your side. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Carl Frank with A&I Wealth Management. And with me today, we've got a full house. We've got Jeff Kromendijk from One Digital. How are you, Jeff? Great, Carl. Thank you. Thanks for being here, my friend. And Nathan Merrill from Goodspeed and Merrill. How are you doing, Nate? Doing really well. I am so excited to introduce your colleague, John Sauer, who is also an attorney for Goodspeed and Merrill and our attorney at a and Wealth Management as well. How are you doing, John? I'm doing excellent. And Thank you for having me. You. Yeah, it's good to see you. Yes, we've had him on before, so... He did such a bang up job before we brought him back as a subject matter expert. Absolutely. And you might be virtual, but you're in our hearts in, in person, John, in theory. <laughs> Thank we you. Really appreciate, you John. We really appreciate We appreciate you a lot more here than on the golf course where you're crushing us Yeah, on the golf course. I was thinking about the, the first podcast that I did. Um, we were right in the heat of COVID. And the four of us all met at your old office, Carl, and sat around the table. And Jeff, Jeff was asking questions because I think we were talking about COVID restrictions. And Jeff was asking questions about how do you maintain workplace culture in a in a remote world? And it's so funny now because we're completely post COVID, but all four of us are remote on this podcast yeah. right now. That is just did a pretty good job. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what kind of culture we have, though. What is this? <laughs> well, I know it. it's it's a traveling one. Clearly, I think we're all separated, with exception of John and I. We're about ten miles apart from each other. We're all separated by by close to two hundred miles in in Nate's case. So here yeah, we are. No but, uh, nonetheless, it's but... good. And I just want to say too, um, John certainly has bailed us out of several uh, issues, and um, just good to be here in John's presence and not being deposed or uh, you know, not being on the clock or something. I, I just, it's cool to hang out with you, John. I think we need to go golfing or something. Yeah, you? absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the last time I was with John, I had just been deposed on a EEOC claim of some sort by some gal that was just after me. And I was about crying after she was done with me. And John just came over across the table, patted me on the back and said, Hey, you did great. It's all going to be okay. <laughs> and it was that thing went completely away no yeah, questions away. Asked. so thanks john appreciate you you're, you're welcome <laughs> that is great well way to way to be our father john thank you for comforting <laughs> us children in the legal affairs where we are completely naive and and easily made fools of i think we're going to need some comforting based on today's topic yeah Holy what is cow. our topic today carl are you going to tell us what we're talking about I am really, uh, when I first heard the news about this, I was um, worried. I was worried. So uh, non-compete agreements apparently might be, there's a chance, becoming illegal across the country. And and almost the last time, John, you were here, I think you were talking about the changes in the Colorado laws regarding non-competes and other things related to that. But now it looks like it's a federal deal. And and there are lots of places in the country that have been living without non-competes. They're still uh, apparently still companies are still there and competitive. So I'm excited to learn about ways we can deal with this and, and if the law actually goes into play and um, what that would mean for a little company like ours and, you know, a slightly bigger company like, like Jeff's and, and then all these companies and all these employees and employers around the country. So 
So John, you know, what, what's going on? Tell us what, what happened and, and, and what are we going to be worried about now? So this has been on the horizon now for about a year and a half. Um, and I've been paying attention to it, but I didn't actually think it was ever going to come to fruition because the proposal was so outlandish. But in January of 2023, the Fair Trade Commission, which is a federal agency, announced that they were going to open a rulemaking process uh, with a proposed rule to generally ban non-competes nationwide. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth debate uh, in my networks and you know within the, the legal communities, online communities that I participate in. And the PR for the people that were in favor of it largely was based on non-competes are effectively a heavy handed way for employers to um, corner the market. There's so many other ways to get what employers say they want out of a non-compete, including uh, civil actions for theft of trade secrets, the full bundle of rights for intellectual property laws, that there really was no need to have a non-compete because it was it's fundamentally anti-competitive in a capitalist market. So everybody kind of just sat with bated breath. They go through this rulemaking process and the rulemaking process effectively they the agency proposes a rule, whatever agency it is, um, and there's a comment period. And there were an astronomical number of comments on this rule. And they're from anybody that's, you know, Joe Schmo that's typing something out on his cell phone, you know, rambling on about not liking Joe Biden to, you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is the the largest uh, business organization, private business organization group lobbying group that I'm aware of. So um, I didn't think that the rule would come out in the original proposed form. Um, I thought that it would be riddled with exceptions. And the way the state law here is in Colorado, which is fairly restrictive as compared to other states nationwide, my view was that I think we're still going to be in this situation in Colorado where I'm just going to have to worry about Colorado law because it's going to be more restrictive than federal law. Well, the rule came out, um, they voted to approve it on April 23rd, 2024, uh, and then the final language was released on May 7th. So it's really it's a really hot issue right now as to what has to happen. Um, but what happens now, anytime one of these rules is imposed, is there's an additional waiting period. So the key date for when this rule goes into effect is September 4th, 2024. Um, we can talk about it, but there's already been a number of lawsuits that have been filed uh, against the FTC and some of the uh, FTC, the individuals on the FTC board that voted in favor of it individually um, by acting outside of their their congressional authority um, or their, their statutory authority under the act. Um, what the rule effectively does is it says there can be no new non-competes in the United States after September 4th, 2024. And then there's some limited exceptions. So the two key exceptions under the, the rule are if there's a pre-existing non-compete with a senior executive that has a policy-making authority within an organization, that non-compete can stay in effect um, past September 4, 2024. Any agreements? Go ahead. Yeah, I want to pause you. Right Maybe you were just getting to this. This actually cancels contracts that are in force yeah that's important right is that really what's going on wow the way that they're trying to do that nate and i get i understand what you're getting at but the, what they're the what the rule says is that you, there can be no enforcement actions of non-competes after september 4th 2024 Ooh. so the contract is not ex post facto invalidated but you can't enforce it, which is a you know six of one, half dozen of another kind of analysis. Yeah, what's but the difference, right? That's that's what that is. Um, yeah. Sorry, that just shocked me a little bit because of this thing we call the Constitution, and you know. <laughs> yeah, where does that come into play? <laughs> Take a swing at it, Nate. I'd like to hear your your thoughts. Well, I mean. Yeah, I mean, you were, you kind of referenced the ex post facto. You can't, de you can't. The Constitution fundamentally allows people to contract with each other. Our, our rights don't come from the government; 
they, they are limited in terms of the government's ability to, to intrude upon our rights and our right to contract pre-existed this regulation and it just seems odd that the they claim authority to come and invalidate a valid contract that was compliant with law before their supposed rule which is my other question is how does this come about through rulemaking and maybe these are where the legal challenges reside is it's not properly adopted under the 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 statute that granted the authority to the ftc to even embark on this type of thing but Anyway, I, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm just a libertarian. So, right. I think there's a job for you there. So anytime there's so anytime there's a change in the law, there's an analysis that has to be done as to whether the law is retroactive or not. And one of the things that happens inherently is that if there's a law that is retroactive, it creates a, a major a major amount of concern. So talk about about mm -hmm. talking about that in this non-compete space. You know, I I negotiate comp packages on behalf of executives regularly, and the the total comp, what this person is going to be paid, um, and what they're going to get for you know equity or whatever is all is all wrapped up in an analysis as to what the true what the contract says or do they have a long non-compete okay they're not willing to agree to a long non-compete right now let's throw another thirty forty thousand dollars at it and say if you're willing to agree for this longer non-compete we're willing to pay you the section thirty forty thousand dollars as of september 4th 2023 if that person is not at the within a policy making position as an executive within a business, the business has set its comp package for this person at a higher rate with anticipation of what its rights would be in the event that they separate. And so when you create a law that has like this law that make it inherently does have some level of retroactive effect, businesses are paying for we're paying for something that they cannot actually really get the anything out of. At some level, without just compensation, They've it is, isn't it? Yeah, taking the contractual right away from us without paying for it. The interesting argument. I mean, the argument. Well, what are you going to do? Take away the thirty or forty thousand dollars extra comp for the employee? There's no way you'd lose them. Yeah, I mean that's inherently. I think that's the. That's they would the enforce that part of the contract. They just won't enforce your ability to enforce the contract. <laughs> but anyway, well, I mean, I think you go back to that safe haven where everybody was trying to comfort themselves when the FTC announced this in 23, which was basically, well, if we're worried about them taking our trade secrets, our confidential information, um, or even our customers because of the non-solicit, uh, we've got other remedies that are available to us that doesn't – that doesn't necessarily just involve the non-compete. So we can get there another way. Uh, we just have to be a little bit more creative and they actually have to engage in some level of a little bit more wrongdoing. So, okay. And I interrupted you right after you introduced this idea that they were canceling enforcement prospectively, but you were about to say something else. So the, so the two key exceptions, the first one is pre-existing non-competes with senior executives. And the second one is a sale of a business. Now, this is something that is going to be important for our firm for sure, but it's a narrow exception. So it depends on the sale. So a, two parties can enter into a non-compete agreement if the seller is selling all or substantially all of their interest in that business. Um, they have to sell all of it to to be able to for the non compete to be enforceable under those circumstances. So does it matter how much they own of the business? You know, if they're a one percent owner, they just have to sell all one percent. That's correct, Nate. What about rollover equity? Would that count as a sale? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Nor does the FTC, which is why it just drives me crazy when people who live in a bubble try to invade the province of the free market and call it we're just fixing capitalism that's all we're doing is fixing capitalism but anyway so just to, my blood's uh, boiling i'm just trying to stay calm so i'm here well again. carl can I you don't think it's necessarily anti-capitalist i mean that's the other piece right i mean it's 
<laughs> more competition is better prices and more efficiency, everything else. Like that's the idea. I want to get Nate started. Jeff joking about muting you. I want you to just get yeah. rolling, man. Yeah, you yeah, can I, see it's starting to steam through boil. the ears here a little bit, but for sure. Um, so two exceptions, just in recap, John, um, and then we can kind of move forward, but um just pre-existing um non-competes for policy making execs. Um, and then the other one is in the context of a transaction where uh, there's actually been um, dollars um, transferred uh, through contract as a result of selling uh, a business or stock in a business or a book of business, I would imagine, similar to what we went through a couple of years ago with One Digital. Um, I, I do remember an extensive amount of you know, contract uh, specifically talking about non-compete, so on and so forth. So when, when money has been, uh, you know, transferred or if there's been a transaction of, of some sort and, and then an asset that received in return, there, there would be protection uh, around that asset um, in that type of a situation. Yeah. So you can't sell your business and go start another competing business. Okay. <clears throat> There's a few other caveats I think that are interesting uh, and worth at least noting. Um, the first one that I think is almost an exception that would swallow the rule if it was utilized correctly is that it doesn't ban garden leave. So one of the things that companies will do occasionally is when they have an executive that's departing, they're going to and they don't want that executive to go take another executive role to business, they'll say, we're going to continue your pay for X amount of months or a year or whatever. You don't have to do any work. You don't have to show up or do work or anything, but you can't go work for anybody else. There's fairly clear uh, positions across the biggest law firms. And, and I've read the rule myself and I agree that uh, garden leave would be permitted. And so effectively you're basically just, you're buying the non-compete on the back end of what their salary was for however long you think it needs to be. So for businesses that think that there's no other way to protect their interests other than preventing someone from working for a competitor, what's their annual salary? How long do you think it's going to take for that to occur? And you can hopefully negotiate a garden leave provision with that exec. Um, Sounds expensive. Yes, that's very expensive. Um, but I think honestly, it's part of what's being shifted here is that the, the costs associated with the, the harm perceived by a non-competer now is now being borne by an employer rather than by the employee. Because if you are subject to a, a, a strictly enforceable non-compete and you can't find work for six months, a year, year and a half, or until the non-compete expires, that's all costs borne by the employee as compared to the employer. And now the option is, well, you can just buy it from the employee. And Nate, if you ever think that I'd like a year or two of garden leave, I'd uh, let's have a conversation. It'd be great. <laughs> 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 well, I'm still thinking of all the ways which this seems to violate principles of a free market rather than support it. But um, <laughs> man, make a list, make a list. Well, uh, and the other thing about garden leave is curious to me. Uh, you know, it, it's not stopping that executive for looking for other work, and as soon as that executive finds other work, she's going to quit this one and start the new one for new employment. And then there you go. It didn't really help, did it? What did I miss? Well, you'd want them to be restrained from leaving, that they wouldn't be able to take other employment for that period of garden leave. So um, you just have to negotiate it in a period that makes sense with your business. Can you, can, would you be able to like just back end it? So we'll pay you all two years salary at the end of two years of not working for somebody else. Potentially. Yeah. I mean, it depends on a few things. <laughs> right. Because, yeah, what if they get halfway through it and they're like, eh, I'd rather just go take this other job and they've gotten half. Exactly. Their and the other job pays better. So you quit the old one and you're like, man, I'm tired of golfing. Well, you hire Goodspeed and Merrill to sue their pants off. <laughs> I was going to say, can you put liquidated damages or is all this still relatively undeveloped where we it's like we could try a bunch of different things or are liquidated damages provisions and something like that even conceivable? 
Yeah, I think you could. I mean, there's no specific language that says you can't. Um, and I think the idea is that you should be facilitated. I mean, people shouldn't be restrained from finding a job in the workplace. And that if the concern is that they, you know, you don't want people to not have a steady paycheck, what Garden Leave does is it solves that problem. They have steady paycheck. They're just beholden to the employer. If it's an at-will employment relationship anyhow, I mean, you can effectively, if you can get them locked up for that period of time on garden leave, it's the same as basically telling them to show up in the office and read the paper for eight hours a day and not giving any job duties. Um, so that's at least an interesting an interesting opportunity for businesses that think they may need to try to enforce one of these um, or try to prevent someone from going to another uh competitor if this rule takes effect. Um, question that I got recently is what impact does it have on franchise agreements? Um, because when you are when you franchise as a franchisee, you always have to sign a non-compete with the franchisor. Um, and it it's one of those weird things because there's so many comments, but the, the rule and the comments issued by the FTC directly address that this this does not apply to fran the franchisee fran franchisee franchisor relationship. It's clear to me, but it would it would the rule would ban a non compete for an employee of a franchise. So, like your McDonald's workers cannot be subject to non competes, but the owner of the McDonald's can be subject to a non compete with McDonald's corporate. Wasn't that whole thing oh, without yeah. mentioning the Subway company that? made sandwiches in Colorado that kind of precipitated the Colorado rule was they were putting like line workers under non-competes. Yeah. So that was a, that was a national issue, but that was Jimmy John's. Yeah. We don't have to disparage them. They have great sandwiches. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so, so have you completed then what you would consider your summary of the rule? I want to talk because as, Carl noted, we want to look at the positives or the, it's not necessarily doomsday here. They have closed down some applications of non-compete. You've outlined the carve-outs, but what about the things that aren't even non-competes and how, where do you see the, the culture of employment evolving so that people can still secure their business relationships and business opportunities without a non-compete? Because I will, I will agree at some level a non-compete is overkill in most situations. It's not like I, as a as a Jimmy John's owner, that I'm honestly worried about one of my line workers going out and opening a franchise Mike and uh, Jersey Mike's across the street. They just don't have the wherewithal to do that, typically. But So where, where do business owners or what avenues do business owners still have open to them with this law or this regulation in mind where they can still, where they should be looking to lock down their relationships and their trade secrets and what other variety of things should we be considering? So I'm always an advocate of an employment agreement for higher ranking individuals in an organization. Um, the key things that need to be in any good employment agreement include a, a really solid confidentiality provision. There's state statutes um, and to some extent, it, it, the FTC rule may address this, but not nearly as much as state law. So, but a great confidentiality provision, it will be very protective. It'll cover all of your trade secrets and your pri pri proprietary information. And then one of the things I make sure we have in all of our agreements is what's called the, the Defend Trade Secrets Act notice. The Defend Trade Secrets Act notice means that if you're able to establish as an employer that an employee's stole trade secrets, you're entitled to triple damages plus your attorney's fees and costs. If you don't have that notice in there, you don't get that level of damages. And realistically, that becomes a gigantic stick uh, in the event somebody runs off with your, with your list. You know, other things, I mean, I'm just talking about legal things, right? But there's other things that you should be doing, right? I mean, you shouldn't you should have your systems in such a way that somebody can't just print off the entire contact list, the prospect list, and you should have some level of, of you know, IT oversight on, on those things to make sure that nobody can take the goods. Um, we've dealt with cases where uh, entire systems have been downloaded, you know, 
you know, I think I think the representation after we talked to our our data expert on that piece of litigation was is almost 50 million points of data that were taken out of this business that have been around for 30 years. It was all, I mean, the person could have utilized it, but almost all of it was too old to be of really any significant value. But I mean, that's pretty powerful that somebody could just come in and stick a USB drive and download your whole system and take your whole business and set it up across town. Um, another thing that uh, is important in that vein is uh, a non-solicitation of employees is enforceable as a contractual term that doesn't get into non-compete world whatever so if you have uh if you have key employees and you're bringing in somebody new you can get them to sign a con an enforceable contractual provision that they're not going to take anybody with them when they leave that helps with preventing mass exodus that helps with preventing um you know a, a major raid of your business um, because there can't be communication amongst the people that are that are participating in the departure. Um, and then you can still have, so this is where state law and federal law get in conflict a little bit here, but the FTC rule does not ban on its face uh, non-solicitation of customers. So you can still have a don't take our customers um, provision in your agreement that would be enforceable. Because it would be enforceable under federal law, then you have to look at what state law is. And in Colorado, that type of a provision, you have to be making a certain th salary threshold. Uh, you have to have received a, you have to provide the employee 14 days to consider it. You have to have a notice provision that identifies that it's there. Um, but that type of a provision, frankly, uh, I think is is very effective in that space. Um, and for the most part, it's just direct solicitation, indirect solicitation. If somebody sets up shop across town and one of your customers calls them and said, I saw you left, that would be indirect solicitation or just a general advertisement that one of your customers responds to, that would be indirect solicitation. Even like LinkedIn, right? Yeah, something like that. Um, those, are, those types of provisions are largely... Uh, very protective and very helpful. And frankly, you're, when somebody leaves, they no longer have access to what you're gonna do in the future. What you're trying to protect at that time is your current client base. And so a non-solicitation of customers gets you very far down the road of trying to protect yourself uh, with with that type of a transition. Goodwill. So John, real quick, um, just to clarify that, you said there are some stipulations around that with regards to compensation of that producer or that salesperson um is that did i hear you correctly like they've got to be compensated at, at a certain level for something like that to to be be viable yeah in the state of colorado that's the law um so federal law non-solicitation of customers is permitted state law when you get to colorado we have our own statute that addresses a non-solicitation of customers um, and Colorado actually treats that as a non-compete provision uh, within a contract. That's not the majority view, well, at least the federal view of non-solicitation of customers. And so to have one that's enforceable has to be compliant with both state and federal law. In this scenario, if you're trying to enforce one of those in Colorado, you're right, Jeff, that you have to have, you also have to have the notice, the 14 days and the salary threshold. Do you know what that threshold is by any chance? It's tied to, it's interesting because it's tied to uh, an inflation marker. I think the last time I looked, it was about 75000 a year. Okay. But if it's a commissioned um, role that doesn't have a base salary, they just have to make more than seventy five. Or, or be anticipated, reasonably anticipated to make more because usually you're signing these contracts on the front end of employment. And so they have to, have, you have to have anticipation that they're actually going to make more than that. Threshold. If they've made 300,000 a year in prior roles and you're hiring them to do the same thing, you have a reasonable anticipation, I would assume. Yeah. Or you've got all their peers that are making significantly more than that threshold. And yeah. John, do you, do you think there's a limit with, independent contractors versus employees, what is the rule there? So 
The word is worker within the within the FTC rule. Even within the Colorado statute, they use the word worker. They don't use the word employee, and they intentionally don't use the word employee. And so, um, on its face, you know, generally speaking, I'm opposed to trying to get a non compete with an independent contractor. Generally speaking, because you have a lot of other lateral issues that come up. And one of them is that a key factor in determining whether an independent contractor is truly an independent contractor is whether they have the freedom to go work for someone else. And if their primary skill set is what they're doing for you and you have them sign a non-compete, you could Im immediately set yourself up for a misclassification lawsuit, wage, wage and hour lawsuit, uh, DOL audits. I mean, it could become a real nightmare um, of what could grow out of that. And I think that there's other ways to protect yourself, like what we talked about, trade secret protection within an independent contractor agreement is appropriate. Confidentiality is appropriate within an independent contractor agreement. Um, those are things that you can use to effectuate the same ends without risking a misclassification in, uh, uh, investigation. Excellent. So how do you handicap it? What are the odds here? What do you think? I think that there's less than a 10% chance that the rule will take effect in September. Wow. Um, at all or as written? At all. Um, that There's two lawsuits right now that are being followed very carefully. Um, they both allege basically the same theories. The, there's three theories. The first is that the FTC lacked or exceeded its statutory authority to issue a non-compete rule. That's That's been something that we've seen through the COVID era invoked often. So OSHA tried to issue this vaccine mandate. That got challenged on what's called the major questions doctrine, that this is a major question. There's major financial, political uh, economic impact as a result of this rule. It's not clearly within your uh, enabling statute and therefore uh, OSHA, you can't issue that rule. Those lawsuits were successful. That rule was uh, drawn back. This is the same type of thing in my view. And if it ever sees the light of day in the Supreme Court, they're, they're going to strike it down very quickly as this is a major question doctrine. So it's it's all of this agency stuff, right? That it, go ahead. <laughs> My heart rate just went down. You you, you just <laughs> you got me all worked up, and then you drop that one on me. I'm like, oh, all right, ten percent Supreme Court, we're good. But anyway, go ahead. it is a major question. I mean, there's not there, in my mind. You know, I know every law firm is different, and every law practice is different. But my practice here as a you know, employee side, employer side, uh, employment attorney at different times, uh, I would say I'm dealing with non-competes somewhere around 30 minutes to an hour of every day. Some days it's all day, some days it's not any, but I think it averages out to something like, you know, probably pretty close to 15, 20% of my practice is trying to deal with and advise on non-competes and restrictions and negotiating around them and dealing with people that are trying to sue each other to effectively get a non-compete. And, and um, it, it, it is a very big deal. I mean, it is a key part of American business. And I don't think that the FTC's enabling statute says on its face, FTC, you can legislate with respect to contractual rights between businesses and its employees in this space. And that's what the argument is, is that if Congress hasn't said you can legislate in that space without oversight, you can't because it's a major question. So. That's compelling. Yeah. So real quick, John, if you can maybe um, recap the effectiveness of non-competes right now, because I've, I've oftentimes heard as well that they're they're just not not enforceable i guess it just depends on what the situation is um but clearly this would change things um you know maybe for the worse um for for business owners who are trying to protect assets and things like that but um how effective are they right now like based on the way the legislation is written currently 
So there's no federal legislation on non-competes, generally speaking, at this point. So this new rule, this FTC rule, would be the first time that the federal government has stepped in and tried to put in regulations around these around these competitive activities. There's some caveats with that that if it's too severe, it's too overreaching, you could potentially end up in an antitrust situation. Um, but that's almost, that's a very rare situation. Um, at, at any rate, what you're looking at for enforceability is always state law dependent. Colorado is one of the more restrictive states with respect to non-competes. Um, it has to be reasonable in time, scope, and business, business activity is what's been restricted. But then Colorado added these additional provisions that you have two levels of a non-compete. You have a regular non-compete, and then you have a non-solicitation of customers non-compete, and those have salary thresholds. You have to give a 14-day notice, and you have to... Um, uh, They have to sign the 14-day notice. Uh, but from there, I mean, if somebody's making the requisite salary at the time that they are seeking to enforce the non-compete, and at the time that the non-compete was signed under those circumstances, you can generally enforce a non-compete in the state of Colorado as long as you check every one of those boxes. It became much more difficult after August 10th of 2022 in Colorado to enforce one because there's always something missing. Didn't get the cover page signed. They're not making the requisite salary, whatever. I'm always looking for those issues. Um, but at the same time, you can do it. And I deal with it. Yeah. I mean, truthfully, you can. Mm -hmm. And most and most states are more lenient than Colorado. New York and California are the two that have their own their own caveats. But Colorado is up there and they're probably the top five most res most restrictive in the country. Okay. Interesting. And then, you know, I don't know how much time we have left, guys, but um, maybe in closing, it'd be interesting to dive into maybe a little bit of the motivation uh, as to why something like this would, you know, would be proposed. Um, I think, Nate, you were alluding to it a little bit here. Like, why why is this even a, an issue? I mean, the chances, of course, of it going through, you said, are less, you know, maybe 10% or less, but... Still, so why why is this being even proposed and and pressed? Um, it, it seems like it's it's coming from California. That I think this is a, a typical legislation that's in place there already. Just uh, knowing, you know, our business, we have a lot of producers in California, and I've heard that the the laws are much different there than they are here. Um, yeah. Can we just maybe throw that around? Like, what what is the motivation around? putting something like this in place. I think from my perspective, John, what you're thinking about it, it looks it looks labor friendly under the guise of uh, competition or capitalism. Like they're, they're labeling it as capitalism or competition friendly, but the, the real beneficiary here is quote unquote labor. And so it makes, it makes the market labor more competitive. So that's where the competition is coming out. It's hurting a, a company's ability to remain competitive. So I don't think it's competitive oriented in that sense, but it's competitive enhancing in the sense of you have to compete harder to keep and retain labor. I think it also puts pressure on businesses to innovate beyond whatever little trade secret that you have, right? Uh, because if the only value in your business is one trade secret that you keep locked in your safe, right? You're gonna that could potentially escape your business because you no longer have some of these enforcement abilities and some of the restrictions. You know, I'm, I've been a lawyer for 12 years now, and so I I only have that that window of a of a view, but. I do think that what's kind of happened is that it's escaped um, any level of perception in terms of trying to create a bespoke agreement for every employee. I mean, you can just you can just rip off 60, 70 copies of the same agreement, make everybody sign it. Doesn't matter if they're, you know, the the lowest level on the totem pole all the way up to the highest level executive and make them sign the same thing. And the reality is, is that there's no need to do that. Um, 
across an entire organization. I think that there has been some significant abuses uh, in that space. The, the Jimmy John's example is the one that always carries the day, but um you know, we had a we've dealt with it in the in the hairdressing space. Uh, you know, you have someone that's effectively providing a personal service for hairdressing, and uh, the business owner makes them sign a, a non compete. Uh, things don't work out at that business, and then she can't go work and set up what her is her primary skill across town, which is in that world is completely a professional or personalized service. I mean, Nathan, you and I have the same benefit as attorneys because as attorneys, some other attorneys were looking out for us and wrote the rules and you can't have a non-compete with a lawyer. Um, it's it's a it's an unprofessional, it's within the rules of professional conduct that lawyers cannot be subject to, to non-competes. And it's weird. This is the craziest thing. It'll probably blow your mind, Carl Jeff, if you haven't heard this before. But when a lawyer leaves a law firm, the law firm is obligated to contact each of that each of the attorney's clients with a letter that says, please check a box as to whether you would like us to continue to represent you or whether you would go with Mr. Sauer or Mr. Merrill as basically an invitation to leave. Well, you interpret that as protecting the attorney. I think the way that's presented, at least my understanding of the rule is to protect clients so that they can choose their representation. They didn't want to create an environment where someone needed your services, John, and weren't able to, provide them because of a contract that I have with you. So that was consumer-based protection, but it's a professional services agreement. I mean, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff, that's a great uh, hornet's nest of a question there. Like what were they thinking, right? (laughs) What were they thinking when they did this? And uh, boy, if I've learned anything uh, over all these years is to not ask what what they're thinking or why, but, you know, what am I going to do about it and what's going to happen next? Well, especially when the rule seems what's to... What's next? Going back to what you were saying, John, that Colorado and California and New York are like are at the deep end of the pool on this stuff, but there wasn't like a national trend moving towards this. And I can see regulatory, you know, agencies getting involved sometimes to to follow the trend, but not not just overlay something that nobody wants across, because that's the whole point of being a representative democracy is we have people we can elect in Ohio or Iowa or Indiana to put these laws into effect within our state. They're trying to nationalize the whole area, it seems. Well, I think that the thing that's concerning to me is that my job always used to be a bit easier um, in the sense that the state Colorado would always be more restrictive than federal law. I never needed to know what federal minimum wage was. Who cares what federal minimum wage is? Colorado minimum wage is up here. I only needed to know the Colorado non-compete statute because it's way more restrictive than the absence of any meaningful federal rules in that space that I deal with. Well, now we have a flip where we've got federal law that's more restrictive than some of the more restrictive states out there. Um, I'll leave you. I I think the one thing that I'll say is that we will know more in the next three or four weeks because there's, there's pleadings being filed and hearings being held in these two lawsuits that are going on. The primary uh, request right now is a preliminary injunction to stop the rule taking effect in September. Uh, I think, you know, this was kind of the same process that happened, um, I think this might have been 2016 when they were going to increase the salary thresholds for minimum wage and the exemptions. Same thing happened. There was an injunction granted. That stuff all got stayed. So the salary thresholds didn't increase until we had basically another presidential election and I guess more approval for that. And then they changed. But um, I think that we'll know a lot more. I'm free to change my mind on that 10%, but I don't think that there's a it may take effect one day, but I don't think it's going to take effect in September of this year. Excellent. Any other concluding thoughts, gentlemen? I think John just plugged himself for a follow-up co- podcast in about six to eight weeks. So Let's do it. We're, we got you booked, John. You confirmed, right? Okay. If I can do it remotely from upstate New York, I'm in. Hey, that sounds good. Awesome. We're down with that. I think they have internet up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you can borrow uh 
You can borrow Nate's satellite link. Perfect. Starlink. Some, some t- what, what is it? Uh, Starlink? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get Nate's That's Starlink fun. going. We'll get it going. I'm a fan. All right. Cool. Guys, great to see you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Good seeing all of you. Yep. Have a beautiful day. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and the information we shared. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. We hope you will join us again next time as we explore new areas of interest to our listeners or current issues we believe are important to discuss. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you are notified when future episodes are released and also share it with a friend that you think would benefit. If you'd like to meet with a member of the Expert Network team, or have a request for a special topic you'd like to have us discuss on the podcast, submit those requests to info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the professional firms represented, including guests nor does it constitute legal, investment, accounting, or other advice of a fiduciary nature. The views expressed are those of the professionals only. Investment advisor services may be provided through A&I Wealth Management. Securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management.